let's make this a short one again today. I'm going to talk about a few things that have been on my mind, because I know you guys love it when I grumble. The patient today, though, is a classic Yamaha from the late 1970s. This is one of the Taiwanese-made FG331s. They were only around from 1977 to 1981. This is part of the Folk series. Smaller body guitars, they're sort of an OM size rather than a dreadnought. Now, if you believe the testimonials of people who are trying to sell one of these, the laminated tops that they have actually sound far superior to those made from solid wood. Mm-hmm. Take a dive into some of the forums about these. It's like a high-control religious group or something. Well, these are well put together. They were aimed at the budget market, of course. Um, but they can sound good. And there are many, 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 many of them. So scarcity is not going to drive the market up for them anytime soon. Doing a neck reset on one of these can be very difficult because of the construction methods employed. In the Japanese factory, they tended to use a whole lot of glue on the front of the neck, which contacts the sides, as well as the dovetail, which makes them cursedly difficult to pull out. At some point, they also started using epoxy, which makes it even worse. Some of these don't have dovetails, they have dowels. Um, if memory serves, some of the Taiwanese ones definitely do. So, unless it's one of the very early Japanese red labels from 1969 or 70, which were put together with hide glue, no repair shop wants to tackle one of these. It makes no sense economically. Like, you know, you could get $800 into a job and someone gets cold feet and decides they're never going to pick it up, and then you're stuck with a guitar that you can't sell because no one wants to pay more than $500 for it. But of course, occasionally, one will surface that is in almost playable condition, and a quick assessment shows that the neck has a bunch of extra relief in it, and the saddle maybe still has some height to it. With those two criteria, we can usually get them down into playing shape for less than the cost of buying another one. This one has obviously seen some play, you know, it's got wear marks on it, which uh, usually bodes well. It seems to suggest it might sound pretty good if we fix it up. Checking the action, we find 9 64ths on the bass side, 8 64ths on the treble, which is way too stiff. With a capo at the first fret, and holding down the bass E string around the body joint, I'll use my feeler gauge here, and find that we have somewhere around 17 or 18 thousandths relief in the center of the neck, which is uh, way too much, which in this case is a good thing. Hopefully, if the truss rod works, we can remove some of that action height. Say what you like about Yamaha, but I've always enjoyed their logo here that's made up of three crisscrossed uh, tuning forks. Looks like something you'd see on a samurai flag. Truss rod cover is actually made of wood, which is also interesting. It's a multiple lamination. It's not something you see on very many budget guitars. The truss rod nut, of course, has been fooled with at some point, but it's not mangled too badly. Looks like it's probably a 5mm. So I'm going to back it off first, and it seems to turn. That's good. So, knowing that it has to come forward quite a ways. I'm going to give it two little turns here. Make sure it's well seated. Okay, it's a pretty big adjustment. Okay, with the capo back on, we're down to about eleven thousandths. So we can tighten a little bit more. And that gives us six thousandths, which I think is probably good for this kind of guitar. Okay, with the capo off, Having done that, the action is now about seven and a half sixty-fourths on the bass, six and a half on the treble, which is moving in the right direction. However, I'll also note that there is a little bit of excess nut height, specifically on the treble strings. The E and B can come down quite a ways. So that will also reduce the action somewhat. That's much better. Of course, these frets are fairly uneven in this area, but just want a little tiny gap there. That little adjustment has brought the E string down to exactly 664ths, which 
which is even better. We're getting into the realm of playability. Having a look at the saddle height here above the bridge, we have about one eighth of an inch. Just ever so slightly less on the treble side, which is about 3.2 millimeters, which means um, this is excellent. We can take off at least a 32nd of an inch, reducing the action by a 64th and getting us into kind of factory standard playability. Another thing to consider is what gauge strings has this been living with for a very long time because they're incredibly crusty and corroded. Uh, looks to be 56 and yeah, 13. So these are a medium set. Uh, I would set this up with a light gauge, 12 to 54 or 12 to 53 if you're using Diderios. And um, that will also put a little bit less strain on the neck which might bring the action down another little hair. So I think we should be a little bit conservative when uh, setting the saddle height to begin with. Then I can change the set of strings to the fresh ones and um, we can dial it in from there just to make sure that we don't overshoot. Wouldn't want this to have too low action. With a lower saddle we're also probably going to want to extend the string ramps um, from the string pinhole forward towards the back of the saddle a ways. This is going to increase the downward pressure on there and um, make sure that it's not flopping around or loose on the top, especially on the E and B strings. The other ones look like they might be okay. This guitar's top is, there's a you know, like, little tiny bit of deforming going on back behind the bridge, but it's not excessive at all. And like I say, it's a plywood top. These tend to be fairly robust. One thing we should also probably take care of is this. Um, these are in kind of rough shape. These are designed to look like sealed gear Grovers, but they are not. Uh, they're just little cover plates that went over an open-backed style tuner. Wow. Real tight. These guitars are very lightly braced for the era in which they were made. This looks like Martin's 1930 bracing dimensions, at a time when Martin itself was using things that were to their massive structures inside the guitars. Uh, you know, they get away with it by using plywood tops, obviously, but um, still, it helps. This thing is going to get electrified with an inexpensive soundboard transducer pickup. Um, mimicking the idea of a K&K &K probably, but um, it's about like one-third the cost of a K&K. &K. These are much larger than you'd find in a K&K &K, obviously, and there's not enough room on the bridge pad for them. So I'm going to place these on the soundboard, sort of in line with the strings, directly behind the bridge pad, which is uh, a fairly small item on these guitars. It's about the same width as the bridge. So we'll put them back here and uh, that should hopefully give us a pretty good rendition of what's going on. In order to do that, of course, I'm going to have to pull out the end pin and ream this hole out um, for the standard size jack. Sometimes these play nice, other times you're going to have to use the soft jaw pliers. And occasionally they seem to be epoxied in and uh, nothing will take them out except breaking them off and drilling right through the center of them. Yeah, I think the plastic is so brittle in this one that that's going to happen. Not a big deal. Not a huge loss. So I'll drill through that. Hey, this being an Asian jack, the barrel is probably 465 thousandths-ish. Yeah. So I'm going to drill this out with a bit which is only 15 thousandths wider. This is a 31 sixty-fourths. Um, if you use a half inch bit on these things, it's just way too big. And um, there just isn't enough pressure from the washer. Uh, they can tend to sort of dish in and you end up with all kinds of problems. You want to keep the bit diameter just slightly larger than the barrel of the jack if possible. Now this is a brad point bit so it's got a leading spur that'll keep things on center. Um, it's also got sharp little spurs on the wings which are going to score the lacquer for me. Uh, I'm going to drill through this plastic part and then as I get close to the surface I'm going to reverse the drill and that's going to score the surface of the finish rather than um, tending to dig right into it. 
Remember, this outside veneer here is probably only half a millimeter thick, and it's pretty chippy stuff, so the scoring line is important. You could also use a, something like a sawtooth or a Forstner bit to do this. Or the other safe way to do it would be to drill a smaller hole and then use a reamer to bring it up to size. I want to clean the area that the transducer dots are going to stick to. If there's any atmospheric oil or grease or something like that, it will prevent proper adherence. End of the jack on a piece of wire goes in through the end block hole. Jack goes on that. I can adjust the washer and nut too close to the uh, proper length. Make sure I've got the spiked washer on there too, that's important. There's bound to be some adjustment necessary to get the correct length. In this case I have to move the nut a considerable amount before it's going to fit properly. The distance between a good fit and a poor fit is oftentimes just like one quarter turn of the nut on the barrel of the jack. Um, I want to see the flat end of the barrel um, just, just barely below the surface so that when it's tightened up the exterior washer is really going to come in contact with that metal rather than getting um, bent into the void around the jack. So the exterior washer goes on, as does the nut. And sometimes, you know, this takes a couple of tries as well. Most of these jacks have a handy little hole through the threads. Um, I've got a, an old drill bit of the appropriate diameter stuck in a holder here, so I can hold that tight while I get in there with the appropriate wrench or spanner if you're in the UK. Again, this wants to be snug, but again, you don't want to deform the wood too much. I mean, that is definitely not going anywhere. Finally, the exterior cover piece goes on top. Snug that up with the soft jaw pliers as well. Just give it a little... That'll keep it from loosening up. And we want the end of the jack to come flush or maybe just slightly proud of the uh, end of the cover plate there. That looks about right. Where the K&K &K transducer dots use a gel super glue to hold them in place on the bridge pad, these ones have 3M adhesive, um, double-sided, which is pretty sticky stuff. And with my light directly over top of the bridge pin hole, I can sort of sight down. These are so generous in size that there's not really a worry of kind of misplacing them right behind the bridge pad. And it requires a pretty significant amount of pressure. They're not going to be under any sort of strain or anything, but press hard for a minute, like white knuckle hard. I'm going to control the wires with this little wire clip that they sent along with the pickup. In order to do that, I want to clean the surface I'm going to be sticking it to very well. Um, I'm going to put it on the side of the instrument. And the sides of guitars tend to get really dirty if they're 45 years old. And saddle comes out. And mark the front. Measure to remove just over 32nd of an inch. Saddle's flat on the shooting board here. I have a block of wood covered in sandpaper. This lets me sight down to my line and make sure I'm taking off material where I want to take it off. The upper tuners were flopping around because the screws holes had become oversized. So I will re-drill those out so they'll fit a 1 8 of an inch dowel. And glue those in place. 
They fit snug in the hole. I'll clip them off, clean up the glue a little bit, let it dry, and then cut them flush. Yeah, these tuners really do require two screws in each one to operate properly. Okay, now you can listen to me vent. So I was checking out my analytics numbers on YouTube here, as one does near the end of the year, and it seems that despite my increasing the number of subscribers I've got and my view numbers, etc., I earned a little more than 19% less from ad revenue this year than I did last year. And yeah, I know people love to hear YouTubers whine about like the machine behind the curtain and all that. But yeah, I think it helps sometimes. I think most of us would attribute this to the adoption of short reels and the amount of promotional time those received over the platform's traditional long-form videos. Anyway, it's always fun to realize that you've worked more hours at something and still managed to take a 20% pay cut. Second thing. You may or may not have noticed that I've stopped putting links to my merch store in the video descriptions. And in fact, today I deactivated those products completely. Um, for the last few years I've had shirts, hats, and stickers available. And, you know, there was pretty good response to those at the beginning. Um, one of the best laughs I've ever had from this business was a photo of an employee at the, on the assembly line at the Martin Guitar Factory at work wearing one of my t-shirts. It was simply marvelous. Anyway, in the last year, I started getting reports that stuff was taking an unreasonable length of time to arrive. Also, sometimes people were getting shirts that were a different brand, you know, other than the Hanes sample that I'd been sent um, from the factory. So, you know, I could kind of chalk that up to, you know, having different facilities in different hemispheres in order to make the whole print-on-demand thing function. Um, however, a friend of mine received the sticker that they'd ordered the other day. Uh, they, they'd ordered in February. They'd also ordered a shirt at the same time, and that took way too long too, but nine months to get a sticker? It's unacceptable, right? So obviously I'm done with those guys. Um, so I decided to initiate a payout from Spring the company that was printing and shipping them for me. Um, usually I let the funds build up to a respectable size before trying to cash out. So I've got what might be the average person's, like a week's worth of pay to the average person coming to me. Or maybe not. Because it's been a couple of weeks worth of business days and nothing from them. So I'm not really holding my breath. Um, just throwing that out there because I know I've got other content creators who follow me. If you're using Spring for your merch, just be aware. Your results may differ, but this is what I'm dealing with. The other afternoon, the mailman shows up, leaving me a message from the tax department with news that they weren't satisfied with the U.S. tax withholding form I provided to show that Uncle Sam takes 30% off right off the top of what I make in YouTube revenue. So Canada wants to charge me on that too. And it's a big chunk of coin. I gotta get it done by the 27th. You know, during the holidays. They left it till the very end of the year and gave me 19 days to pay thousands and thousands of dollars. Which seems like a Dickensian level of villainy, right? You know, why would you do that at Christmas time? Again, I'll be okay, you know, from the retirement savings. Because, you know, if we're honest, guitar repair people tend to expire before they retire. So... It's fine. It's fine. I spend probably 600 hours a year filming and editing this stuff. And, oh, is it worth it? I don't know. No, don't worry. I'm not going to stop. I am going to try and find a different print-on-demand company because I have, like, a really fun new design I'm kind of excited about. I want to put that into the works. I've got to get it, you know, done up properly by someone who's better at graphic design than I am. Um, I'm going to keep making videos. You know, I might actually break down and activate my Patreon, like the cool kids do. 
and I can see why. Because I'm not sure what I can provide on Patreon. Maybe the world gets to see three videos a month and patrons get to see the fourth as an exclusive. I don't know yet. I'll make it work somehow. Polishing, polishing, polishing. Again, I'm, I'm directing this mostly to people who live outside the U.S. who want to monetize a YouTube channel. Okay, we'll call this one ready. At the end of the day, the action ended up 6 64ths on the bass, 5 on the treble. Which is like, what's that, close to 40% lower than when it arrived? Don't think you could ask for much more. Um, you know, it is a Taiwanese Yamaha. Could possibly use a partial refret. Could use a whole lot of things, to be honest, but... Where do you stop on something like this? I think uh, it's much more playable and um, good for another 10 years. Mm -hmm.